BTEC Applied Science Unit 5, the urinary system structure and function. So plodding on with the biology, this is about the urinary system, which is basically to do with the kidneys. There are a couple of other things involved as well, but pretty basic stuff. You've got two kidneys. That's where they are in the body. Uh, they are supplied with blood from the renal arteries and blood leaves them through the renal veins. Uh, they take rubbish out of your blood and water out of your blood, which then goes through the ureters where it's stored in the bladder. And then when the bladder's full, uh, you get a message to go to the loo. Okay, so you've got the kidneys, the renal arteries and veins, the ureters and the bladder. The main functions of the kidney, uh, first of all, excretion, which means getting rid of stuff. And the kidneys remove waste and toxins. So stuff your body doesn't need and poisonous stuff, in particular, a substance called urea. And it removes it from the blood uh, and it's transported to the bladder as urine. The other important job of the kidney is osmoregulation. And this means controlling the amount of water, or rather the balance between water and dissolved substances, dissolved salts in the bloodstream, osmoregulation. I'll talk a lot more about this later on. About 170 litres of blood may be filtered by your kidneys every day. That's a lot of blood. Uh, only one or two litres may become urine. So, hopefully you remember from GCSE osmosis. Now osmosis is the movement of water through a membrane. It's a bit like the diffusion of water. In diffusion you have stuff going from a high concentration to a low concentration. In osmosis you have stuff, well you have water going from a place where there's lots of water through a membrane to a place where there's less water. That's osmosis. Uh, this is imp very important for our cells, for example, for our red blood cells. If outside of our cells there's not enough water, uh, in other words, there's too much salt dissolved in it, so the concentration of salt is too high, then what will happen is that water will move out of the cell by osmosis and the cell will shrivel up. If there's too much water outside of the cell, and not enough salts, so the concentration of salts is low, then what will happen is that water will move into the cell and this can damage the cell. The cell might burst. What we want is about the same concentration inside and outside the cell. And we say that this is isotonic. So osmoregulation, the amount of water in your blood must stay the same and the concentration of dissolved substances. Uh, you could call them electrolytes, you could call them ions. Uh, so for healthy function, the concentration of stuff dissolved in your blood should stay about the same. The fluid surrounding our cells needs to have a constant concentration of dissolved salts, mostly sodium and potassium, and also a constant pH. And that's all to do with hydrogen ions, you should remember from chemistry. The amount of water that your kidneys remove from your blood is controlled by a hormone called ADH, uh, which is produced in the pituitary gland. And I'm going to talk a lot about that now. ADH. Now, each kidney is made up of about a million filtering units, and they're called nephrons. This is a simple diagram. It's going to get a little bit more complicated in a bit. So we'll start simple and then we'll add bits to it. So this is a nephron and there's about a million of them. And the two main bits of it, there's a glomerulus and a tubule. The glomerulus is a ball of capillaries uh, and blood from the renal artery 
uh, it gets split up into arterioles, then that gets split up into lots of capillaries, and the glomer glomerulus is a little ball of capillaries with very high pressure blood in it. And what happens is that all the little bits and pieces in the blood get squeezed out and they go into the tubule. Uh, and the glomerulus filters your blood and it takes out basically all of the little stuff and most of the water. Small molecules pass through its thin walls, large molecules and red blood cells stay in the bloodstream. Uh, so it's taking out basically all of the stuff and a lot of it your body needs. So what happens in the tubule is that all the good stuff goes back into your blood. All the rubbish stays in the tubule and the good stuff is reabsorbed. So most of the water is reabsorbed and minerals and nutrients, including glucose, are reabsorbed. And then what's left over, the remaining fluids and all the waste stuff, such as the urea, becomes urine. OK, it's called ultra filtration because good stuff and bad stuff is removed. OK, uh, and most of the water is also filtered out. Only a lot, only large molecules, as I said, and blood cells remain. So here's a more complicated diagram. There's a few things added to it. And let's work our way through this diagram then. So we'll start with the Bowman's capsule. Now the Bowman's capsule, I'll show you on the diagram, is here. The Bowman's capsule surrounds the glomerulus. So I said this glomerulus is a bunch of capillaries, very high pressure blood, all the little bits and pieces get squeezed out of it and they are absorbed in the Bowman's capsule and that's where they go into the tubule. OK, so it surrounds the glomerulus and helps us to filter blood, the Bowman's capsule. The first part of the tubule it goes into is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal means close to because it's close to the glomerulus. Convoluted because it's all twisted up. And that gives it extra length. OK, the proximal convoluted tubule. Now what that does is it reabsorbs nearly all of the glucose, 95% of the glucose, uh, most of the amino acids and small peptides, uh, most of the water and salt is reabsorbed. Most of the stuff is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. What is left goes then into the loop of Henle. And in the loop of Henle, uh, we get more water is reabsorbed uh, and sodium chloride is also reabsorbed. So it passes down the descending, then the ascending loop of Henle, and it goes into the distal convoluted tubule. Distal as in distant, far away from the glomerulus. What happens there? This fine tunes the reabsorption. So it may absorb a little bit more water, a bit more salt, just to get the perfect balance, just to get it where it really needs to be. So it fine tunes the absorption. Then what's left over goes into the collecting duct and then lots and lots of collecting ducts join together and form the ureter and that takes this liquid urine to the bladder. Something else actually happens in the collecting duct, which we'll talk more about in the next section, which is uh, a hormone called ADH. Now, what ADH does is it causes channels to open up in the collecting duct, uh, which lets water escape back into the blood. Why? We shall see in a minute. So ADH is antidiuretic hormone is ADH. Now the system, uh, there's a thing in your brain called your hypothalamus. And amongst other things, what it does is it monitors the concentration of salts in the blood. Uh, and it decides basically, is the blood too salty 
Is there not enough water or is the blood not salty enough? Is there too much water? And what the hypothalamus does is it tells the pituitary gland to uh, produce more or less ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And then this hormone travels through the bloodstream. It's a chemical messenger. It travels through the bloodstream and it tells the kidney to do stuff. If there's not enough water in the blood, if your blood is too salty, then uh, the pituitary, pituitary gland produces more ADH and the kidney reabsorbs uh, more water into the bloodstream. If there's too much water in the blood, then the pituitary gland produces less ADH and the kidney reabsorbs less water into the bloodstream. Blood pressure control. It's very important that your blood pressure isn't too high or too low. If your blood pressure is too high, this can cause damage to blood vessels. It can damage the heart, the kidneys and the brain. It's not good for you. Bigger risk of a heart attack as well. Low pressure, low blood pressure is also not good for you. Uh, if your vital organs, your important organs don't get enough oxygen, don't get enough nutrients, then uh, they stop working properly and they can shut down and it can lead to shock as well. So your blood pressure should be within certain limits to be healthy. Now, what controls your blood pressure is, it's called the RAS mechanism, R-A-A-S. The RAS mechanism monitors and controls the blood pressure. So here's a job for your flashcards, the Renin, Angio, angiotensin aldosterone system. Wow, luckily you don't have to say it, you just need to be able to write it down. The Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. What's that then? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's a bit complicated. Now, let's work our way through it. This is a, a very, very simple version of it. I can't imagine you'll need anything more complicated than this. So the renin angiotensin aldosterone system regulates blood pressure and fluid balance. So what happens is, let's work our way through it. Let's say your blood pressure is too low. Now, if your blood pressure is too low, uh, your kidneys produce a substance called renin. Okay, and your liver produces this stuff, angiotensinogen, okay? The angiotensinogen gets broken down, the renin breaks it down into angiotensin. And the angiotensin is this stuff here. So we've done the renin and the angiotensin, haven't we? Now, the angiotensin does a couple of things. One thing it does is it tells your blood vessels to constrict, to become narrower. And if your blood vessels, such as your arteries, become more narrow, that is going to increase your blood pressure. Your blood pressure will go up. OK. Also, the angiotensin sends a message to your adrenal gland. Now, your adrenal glands are on the top of your kidneys. Uh, you might know that they also produce something called adrenaline, which makes your heart beat faster. But here they are told the angiotensin tells your adrenal glands to release this stuff here, which is called aldosterone. No, aldosterone. I beg your pardon. Aldosterone. Yeah, yeah. Go on then. Aldosterone. And aldosterone uh, tells your kidneys to re retain, keep more sodium ions. So keep more sodium ions. So basically uh, release more water and that produces higher blood pressure as well. Okay, so angiotensin tells your blood vessels to constrict, tells your adrenal glands to reduce, to produce this hormone and this hormone, aldosterone, tells your kidneys to retain more sodium ions and both of these have the effect of increasing your blood pressure if it needs to be increased. 
will you be able to or rather would you have to write down all of this diagram and the answer is no but I've seen a couple of questions which ask you to explain parts of it you know describe the effect of angiotensin yes uh, things like that so it's it is worth learning and this is a very simple version of what goes on treating kidney disease if your kidneys aren't working properly for whatever reason maybe due to an accident or something they've been damaged in some other way uh, treating kidney disease dialysis what can happen is we can filter the blood outside of your body and then replace it and that's called dialysis uh, another option is a kidney transplant and this is where you get uh, you replace the damaged kidney with a healthy kidney from a donor it may be a, a very generous living donor or it could be from a dead donor maybe somebody who died in an accident recently if they've got a healthy kidney there it could save your life okay so dialysis and transplant are two options dialysis now so what happens is that blood is taken out of your arm and it goes through a machine and the machine basically does the same job as your kidneys uh, it takes away waste products and excess water and then the blood goes back into your arm so filtration takes place through a semi permeable membrane which is a membrane which lets some stuff through uh, and other stuff can't get through okay uh, and the idea is it removes waste products from your blood uh, the advantages of dialysis well one big advantage is that it keeps you alive if you're not having it if you need it um, it greatly reduces the levels of urea in your blood urea is very poisonous if the level of urea is too much it can kill you and it corrects the level of water and ions in your blood correct water and ion levels are restored disadvantages uh, is well the biggest one I think is it takes a lot of time typically you need three treatments a week and each one lasts for four hours so you spend a lot of your week on a dialysis machine if you live next door to a hospital that's not so bad but you might live miles and miles away so it's a big part of your life having dialysis uh, it can be painful there's tubes going in and out of your arm um, there's a risk of infection there's a risk of blood clots the machines are very expensive uh, it's not as effective as a transplant nowhere near as effective as a, a real kidney and the patients need to be very careful about what they eat and drink so a kidney transplant kidney transplantation is much more effective than dialysis a real kidney will work much much better than one of these machines and patients can eat and drink normally and they have a, a greater life expectancy as well uh, disadvantages there is a long waiting list a lot of people will die while they are waiting for a kidney transplant okay there's a long waiting list uh, it's a major surgical procedure so that in itself is risky and once you've got your new kidney for the rest of your life you're going to have to take medicines to stop your body from rejecting the kidney to control infection um, and frequent monitoring and that's for the rest of your life immunosuppressants they're called to stop your body rejecting this foreign object to repress your immune system so that it doesn't attack so white blood cells don't attack this new object in your body